This is Dr. Robert France. I'm professor of cardiology at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, and director of the Mayo Pulmonary Hypertension Clinic. I'm here today with Dr. James Klinger, professor of pulmonary medicine at the Alpert Medical School of Brown University and director of the Rhode Island Hospital Pulmonary Hypertension Center. Today, we're going to spend a few minutes talking about the pulmonary arterial hypertension guidelines and how we see them utilized in clinical practice. Dr. Klinger, thanks so much for taking the time to chat with me today. My pleasure to be here, Bob. So when we think about these guidelines, they're meant to be just exactly that, sort of touch points for us as we think about how we should evaluate, diagnose, and treat patients with this rare and difficult disorder of pulmonary arterial hypertension. Jim, could you talk a little bit about how people should deal with a patient who they've suddenly realized appears to have pulmonary arterial hypertension with regard to how they approach this patient? Sure, I'd be glad to. So, you know, the initial point is really trying to confirm the diagnosis uh, to make sure that this is a patient that truly has what the World Health Organization has diagnosed or, or classified as group one pulmonary arterial hypertension. And this is that rare disease that attacks the blood vessels, usually in the distal pulmonary circulation and usually before the capillaries. And it's important to distinguish that disease from the more common types of pulmonary hypertension that we see with pulmonary venous hypertension caused by chronic lung disease or chronic heart disease, and then the chronic pulmonary hypertension that we see associated with chronic lung diseases as well. So once upon a time when this was a relatively rare disease and a relatively small number of treatments that were available, uh, there wasn't a lot of recommendations uh, to be made. But as the field has progressed and the number of drugs uh, to treat this disease has increased, uh, the choices have as well. And so about 10, 15 years ago, many of the professional societies started to get together and put together guidelines for the diagnosis and treatment of pulmonary hypertension. And there are three or four societies that do this, uh, the uh, American College of Chest Physicians, the World Health Organization, and the uh, Joint Task Force, the European Society of Cardiology and European Respiratory Society, have been putting these out about every three or four years for the last 15 years or so now. Interestingly enough, they'll actually be updated this year. The World Symposium met this year in France, and they'll be coming out with their recommendations at the end of 2018. And the American College of Chest Physicians is in the process of updating their 2014 guidelines. But they all have a, a relatively similar approach, uh, and it usually starts with considering uh, when you've made the diagnosis of referring the patients to patients that are expertise in pulmonary hypertension. This is done primarily because it's a rare disease, and many physicians don't have an opportunity to have the experience that sometimes is needed to manage these difficult patients. And then there are some general considerations that are usually discussed in the guidelines about whether or not these patients should have a supervised exercise program, or whether or not they should be anticoagulated, whether or not they need oxygen or diuretics. Um, but when those things are resolved, then people usually proceed on to right heart catheterization. And this, of course, has become the, the critical way of diagnosing the disease. It's absolutely imperative to know what the pre-capillary pulmonary arterial pressure is and the post-capillary or pulmonary venous pressure is. And then the cardiac output is so important because the pressures will change with cardiac output. And as the cardiac output goes down, the pressures can go down as well. So sometimes people with pulmonary hypertension that look relatively mild, an echocardiogram can actually have severe pulmonary hypertension if you divide that pulmonary arterial pressure by the cardiac output and calculate the pulmonary vascular resistance. Jim, it seems like there's kind of been some degree of uncertainty about who should be doing these right heart catheterizations to, to be definitive about this diagnosis and get good quality data. What, what are the sort of the pitfalls about the right heart catheterization and, and important touch points for people with regard to getting that done well? Yeah, the main thing is to have some experience in analyzing the, the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure because this is where you're going to be determining what the pulmonary venous pressure is. And then from that, you have to subtract that from the pulmonary arterial pressure to see what the transpulmonary gradient is. There's also, I think, some subtleties in how cardiac output is assessed uh, because uh, the pulmonary vascular resistance is important here, and you get that by dividing the transpulmonary gradient by the cardiac output. Um, but most cardiologists who, who do this on a regular basis, and of course most pulmonary doctors that are familiar with doing right heart catheterizations can get these numbers fairly easily. Uh, again, I think the more times you've done it and the more 
practice you've had in obtaining the good wedge pressure and feeling confident that you know what that wedge pressure is, the, the better situation that you're in. I think the worst thing you can do sometimes is to refer the patient out for a right heart catheterization, not knowing who's doing it or what parameters they want you to look at in particular. If the patient goes through the right heart catheter, you want to make darn sure that when it's done, you've got all the information that you need. And you really need those three pieces more than anything else, a good, solid estimate of what the pulmonary arterial pressure is, a confident estimate of what the pulmonary venous pressure is, and then a good idea of what the cardiac output is. But what about the issue of vasodilator testing? And which patients should actually get vasodilator testing, and what are the options for doing that? Yeah, so that's a very important point. Um, when the patient is in the catheterization lab, once the diagnosis of pulmonary arterial hypertension has been made and there's a demonstration of a large pulmonary transpulmonary gradient, then it becomes important to know whether or not the patient is got that gradient or has that gradient because their vessels are vasoconstricted or because there's been some type of obliterative pulmonary vascular remodeling that's resulted in an, in an increase in that transpulmonary gradient. So the easiest way to find out is to give a agent that causes pulmonary vascular smooth muscles to relax, and that's usually done in the cath lab now using inhaled nitric oxide because it's so selective for the pulmonary vasculature and because it's so short-lived, or an infusion of prostacycline, uh, which is also uh, quite uh, selective for the pulmonary circulation, and occasionally uh, sometimes uh, intravenous uh, adenosine. And for a rare number of patients, usually in the 10% or less group, uh, there'll be a striking improvement in pulmonary arterial pressure, almost always accompanied by an increase in cardiac output and very little change in the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. The pulmonary vasodilator response is usually defined as a drop in mean PA pressure of at least 10 and a decrease in mean pulmonary arterial pressure to below 40 milligrams of mercury. So that at the end of the vasodilator trial, the, the PA pressure has dropped both 10 and gotten below 40. And if that occurs without any decrease in cardiac output, then we call that a positive pulmonary vasodilator response. And those patients will frequently respond very well to calcium channel blocker therapy alone, although frequently you have to use a relatively high dose of calcium channel blockers. And about half of the patients that respond will lose that response in the first year, so they require a very careful follow-up to make sure that they continue to respond well to a calcium channel blockers. There are some concerns that if patients are very unstable, if they have low cardiac outputs or they have low blood pressure, that the calcium channel blockers can cause hypotension or even sometimes that the inhaled pulmonary vasodilators or acute pulmonary vasodilators like epoprostenol can drop blood pressure. So people that are hemodynamically unstable, sometimes people are more cautious about doing the, the pulmonary vasodilator trial. And then people who have a elevated pulmonary capillary wedge pressure or pulmonary venous pressure, there's always the concern that a pulmonary vasodilator will increase blood flow through the pulmonary circulation, and if the left side of the heart can't handle it or if there's any obstruction due to mitral valve disease or anything else that, that can induce pulmonary edema. So in those patients with an elevated pulmonary capillary wedge pressure in the cath lab, we try to avoid the pulmonary vasodilator challenge. But for most of the other patients, we, we usually recommend that. Well, great. Thanks a million for going through that. So let's say we've got our patient now. We are confident that they have a group 1 pulmonary arterial hypertension diagnosis that's solid. What do the guidelines tell us about what our goals of treatment should be and, and how we're sort of selecting initial vasodilator treatment approaches for our patients? Sure. So most of the guidelines now will use a rather subjective but important criteria for determining the, the right therapy to initiate, and that is the patient's symptoms. Uh, and they usually divide this into four categories, uh, group one through class four, based on the New York Heart Association classification. But roughly people in class one have no symptoms, and people in class two have symptoms uh, with exertion, and people in class three have symptoms even with uh, routine activity and then people in class four have symptoms with any activity or sometimes at rest. And so people in those better classifications, people in functional class two or functional class three, are generally recommended to try oral therapies, and there's quite a few that are available, and they appear to be relatively equal in efficacy, and so there aren't any general recommendations about which ones that are used. People who are in functional class four are people we're very concerned about because once you get to the end stages that are very symptomatic, um, there's a rather significant short-term mortality. And so we think those people ought to be treated up front with the most aggressive therapy. And for those patients, what's recommended is an intravenous infusion of epoprostenol. This is a continuous you know, 24-hour infusion, so it requires the insertion of a central line and ongoing uh, monitoring. But that's the general breakdown. 
And then for those people who are on oral therapy who do well, uh, they're usually followed on those oral therapies. For those people who don't respond well to oral therapy, then usually we add additional oral agents. And if they still don't respond well, then, of course, they get referred for initiation of intravenous prostacyclin therapy as well. So that functional class is sort of one component of risk, and obviously functional class is somewhat subjective. And so for the class four ones, I totally agree. Those are the ones where I get a phone call from a a referring uh, provider in another institution who says, I have this patient, they're class four, looks like they have a new diagnosis. And I just say to send them up, I put them straight in the hospital, put them immediately on IV prostanoids and, and start therapy. And those really are the ones that need to be referred immediately to an expert center and not wait two weeks to get insurance approval for the drug and all that kind of thing, but really just hospitalize them and start therapy immediately. But as far as these functional class two and three ones, which is really the majority of patients that are seen with a new diagnosis of PAH, there are other sort of components to the um, recommendations and the guidelines about risk stratification. Could you talk about some of those other aspects in terms of getting beyond just the functional class? Sure. Yeah, I'd be happy to. And and you're absolutely right. This is critical. You know, the whole idea is to try to determine clinically how advanced the disease are. And some of the things that we look at in addition to how the patient feels is their performance. So one of the things that's often looked at is the distance that they can walk in six minutes. In general, people that walk more than about 440 meters in six minutes are in a relatively low risk for short-term decompensation. And those who walk less than 165 meters or so are at much higher risk. The reason that this occurs, of course, is because these are the people that are developing right heart failure, and so they simply don't have the strength in the right ventricle to maintain normal walking distances. So the other thing you can look at is clinical signs of right heart failure. When they're absent, we feel the patient's in a lower risk strategy, uh, category. When people have signs of right heart failure, which include things like peripheral edema and drug their venous distension and RV heave, we get much more concerned that they're in a high risk. And that can be coupled with uh, more objective parameters like uh, echocardiographic imaging of the heart. Uh, When the right ventricle looks like it's normal size and function, and when the right atrial pressure is estimated to be normal, these patients are usually in a better spot. On the other hand, if their right atrial pressure looks elevated and the right ventricle looks dilated and dysfunctional, uh, that puts them in in a bad situation. Other things that are very helpful are natriuretic peptide levels. It's a good serum biomarker. Uh, People with a BNP level less than 50 or a uh, N-terminal pro-BNP level less than 300 are generally considered to be in low risk. And those with BNPs greater than those numbers, greater than 300 for a BNP and a NT pro-BNP greater than 1,400 are considered to be in high risk. And then, of course, the right heart catheterization can give you very important information. So... People that have right atrial pressures that are elevated, uh, particularly greater than 14 or 15, are in high risk. People with a cardiac index that's less than 2 liters per minute squared uh, are at higher risk, uh, as are people with low SVO2 sats or mixed venous oxygen saturations of below 60%. So you can kind of make a table of you know whether or not people have risk factors that are high for increased short-term mortality or low, and if they're all in the low, uh, they usually do well in oral therapy. Uh, if they're all in the high, they should definitely be on prostacyclin therapy. And if they're in between, and sometimes we see that people have some high risk factors, some low risk factors, then that's the time to sit down and come up with a plan with the patient about how aggressive they want to be with the therapy. Well, that's great, Jim. I think you've done a a great job helping us understand better where these guidelines fit in our practice patterns and and help us out with our treatment of these difficult patients. Any other closing thoughts that you have about these guidelines and how they should be utilized by providers in assessing our pulmonary hypertension patients? Yeah, I think it's important to remember that guidelines are a composite of data that we know from controlled studies that help guide us and sometimes knowledge gaps where we don't have the data and we do as as best as we can. Just because something's published in a guideline doesn't mean that it has to be done that way. But the nice thing about the guidelines is you get a general opinion of what, you know, a group of experts kind of agrees on when they sit down at a table. And so it gives the practitioner something that they can have some confidence in in following. And I think, you know, just to summarize the guidelines, the the big points that, that all of them make and I think will continue to make is that when patients are diagnosed, the diagnosis needs to be uh, secured, and that needs to be done through right heart catheterization and careful estimates of the patient's acute vasoreactivity by some type of a vasodilator trial. And then those patients who are low risk, 
can be offered oral therapy, and those people that are high risk uh, should be on intravenous prostacycline. And of course, if there's any question about what category they fall into, that's where the centers of expertise can really be helpful. Once upon a time, it was difficult to find a, a center of expertise because there weren't that many places that were doing it. Uh, but nowadays, uh, most major medical centers have got a, a designated center for pulmonary hypertension. And there's even, uh, you know, uh, societies now, particularly the, the Pulmonary Hypertension Association, uh, which lists uh, certified centers of pulmonary excellence and pulmonary hypertension so people can go to their websites and get information about where the closest center in their area is. That's terrific, Jim. It's been great chatting about this today, and I look forward to further discussion of other topics in the days ahead. Thanks, Bob.